Hello, hello, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us here today for the Let's Learn.net Auth and Identity event. Uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are joining us from. We are so happy that you are joining us here today for this event. Uh, I'm joining in from New York. My name is Jamie Singleton. Uh, I will be your host for today. I work on the uh, community program, uh, developer team at Microsoft. Uh, and today I am joined with some awesome experts as we're gonna walk through getting you started with authentication, uh, authorization, and identity. Um, so before we get started, I just wanna walk through the agenda for today. So if you want, you can all head um, over to uh, the Let's Learn event page. Um, and at the top of that, there's a little link that says uh, Auth Resources. Yep, there we go. Thanks, Kim. Uh, so Auth Resources, um, that has all of the uh, resources for this event. It has a link to the event page. Uh, it also has a link to both workshops that we'll be doing. Uh, it has, um, uh, oh yeah, a blog uh, and also a place to download.net. Um, and then if we go back to the event page, Cam, thank you. And we scroll down, there's the event agenda. Uh, here you are here with me, Jamie Singleton. Uh, we'll get started just in a moment with Cam Soper to talk about uh, the fundamentals of authentication, authorization, and identity. Um, we'll take a quick Q&A. We'll do the first workshop. Um, another Q&A and the second workshop. And then don't worry, we'll save time at the end for more questions. We wanna make sure that we answer as many questions as possible. We're here to help you. Uh, we do have uh, experts in the chat, uh, so feel free to ask your questions there. Um, and we'll do the best to answer all of the questions that we know. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna bring on Cam, who's my first host. Let's go, there we go. Hey, Cam. Hi, Jamie, how are you doing? I am great. I am great. It is a sunny day, and so I couldn't be more grateful. Um, so why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Cam Soper. I am a content developer here at Microsoft. I work on uh, lots of different .NET topics. Um, I'm also kind of into doing the streaming and video stuff. Folks may have seen me on On.NET Live, where uh, we have a weekly uh, webcast where we feature uh, guests from the community. Lovely. Uh, I absolutely love that. Yeah, uh, I work with Cam a lot and I am so excited to have you uh, for our first presenter today. Um, so why don't you give us a little rundown uh, of kind of what you're going to be talking about and, and I'll let you take it from there. Okay, so um... Go ahead and share my screen real quick. Uh, what we're so Matt and I are going to be going through two different Microsoft Learn modules today. Um, the first one is going to deal with ASP.NET Core Identity Framework, which is the built-in authentication for ASP.NET. Uh, I'm sorry, ASP.Core Web Apps. Um, the second module we'll be going through will be the Microsoft Identity Platform, which is uh, third-party authentication that you can integrate into your application. Uh, you can, Matt's, I'm sure, going to show you ASP.NET Core, but the cool thing about Microsoft Identity Framework is it's you know, pretty platform agnostic. It's a cloud-based service, and you can integrate it with lots of different services. So before we dive in, we should talk about terms, right? Let's talk about authentication. What is authentication? So authentication is the process by which the user proves who they are. OK, so there's lots of different ways we can authenticate. We can authenticate with a username and password or like Microsoft has done uh, a lot. If you use your Microsoft account online, they have switched to really pushing passwordless authentication where um, you are authenticated by sending a notification to your phone, a, a known phone that is a known device that you have. And there's lots of different authentication mechanisms. But the the, the takeaway is authentication is how the user proves who they are. Now, authorization is the process by which the app decides what an authenticated user is allowed to do, right? So is this user allowed to view this page? Is this user about to allowed to make this change? Now, because it depends on knowing who the user is, that means you cannot have authorization unless you have authentication. So I kind of alluded to the fact that we're going to go over two different ways of doing authentication in ASP.NET Core web apps, right? Um, the model I'm going to show you is the framework built into ASP.NET Core, but that 
framework is, could be categorized as building your own. I mean, it's it's a Microsoft scaffolded thing, but you're building your own and you're maintaining your own and and it's yours to to care for and feed and 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 patch and update and do security audits on. Right. That's very important. Um, so there's the care and feeding that goes into building your own. Right. Uh, if you're going to build your own again for ASP.NET Core apps, use the identity framework, the built in framework. Uh, and that's what I'm going to be showing you. Uh, if you want to use a third-party authenticator, the, you know, a third-party system like Microsoft Identity Platform, or surely there's lots of other ones out there on the market like Okta and, and uh, Authy and Identity Server, um, that's totally an option too. And I'll be honest, in a lot of scenarios, I prefer using a third-party authentication provider, right? Because I don't, I don't want to handle the care and feeding of building my own, right? Um, totally an option. And there's it, at the end of the day. Which one do you want to use? Well, it depends. It depends on a lot of factors, right? It depends on your organization, what's acceptable for the security professionals in your organization. Um, it depends on how much care and feeding you want to give your own uh, authentication mechanism moving forward. Um, it, it depends on if you want to manage user credentials, if you want to be responsible for managing user credentials and, and protecting those user credentials. Um, again, the, 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 the broad answer is it depends. My preference in a lot of scenarios is third party, but I could see why certainly a lot of people would prefer building their own. Um, so that's really the, the, the broad strokes of what we're going to be talking about today. We're going to be talking about authentication and authorization, both with the identity framework and with a third party authentication provider. Um, I realized that was probably a bit briefer, Jamie, than, than what the agenda called for, for the introduction to the topic. Um, but I, I realized we were pausing for Q and A there. So, um, why don't we go ahead and open that up for, for questions before we dive in? Yeah, absolutely. So we did actually get a few questions already, which is great. Um, and no worries about the timing. Uh, we're all just flowing here. So uh, a few of the questions um, that we have received already is, let me pull this down. There we go. Um, so uh, how permissions affect domain roles? So interestingly enough, you bring up domain roles. Um, and I'm going to I'm going to put a caveat on this that I am just a a I I, I you remember the old Saturday Night Live sketch I'm just a simple caveman these <laughs> things scare and confuse me um, I am just a simple web developer and um, I, my the the angle that I'm going to bring to most of this is um, as a web developer that is consuming these services. Um, and when we start talking about domains and like active directory controllers, I know just enough to be super, super dangerous. <laughs> so the best um, kind. <laughs> so um, I, I, I tend to avoid those topics. Now, just to clarify, what we're talking about is all web-based authentication, right? So when, when we talk about active directory domain controllers, we're generally talking about, you know, authenticating on a local area network or a wide area network that's that's private, um, but, but we're not talking about internet authentication authentication, right? Um, we're talking about internet authentication in web apps. Now, whether your app does the authentication or a third party does that authentication, that that's up to you. Um, but Active Directory itself doesn't really enter into this. Act Azure Active Directory, which is a completely different beast, that does. And, that, and Matt will be talking about that. Great. Yeah. So Matt will cover that later on in the event today. Uh, great. So another question we have is, um, as a refresh token. Okay. So, um, <laughs> that comes to the third party app, uh, third party authentication scenario that Matt will be talking about a little bit later on, uh, to, to define what a refresh token is when you do third party authentication, you go to a web app and the web app redirects you to the token server, whoever's doing the authentication. Like say, for example, you go to office.com and it redirects you to login.microsoft.com or whatever that URL is. And that login.microsoft.com, you enter in a, 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 a credential, right? And it redirects you back to office.com with a bearer token. 
Um, and there is a process by which that bearer token can refresh itself over time. And you don't need to make the user log in again. Um, I'm not sure if this is covered in what in the module that Matt will be talking about later on, but he can probably address that a little bit. Okay, well, thanks for touching on that. I appreciate it. Um, okay, here's, okay, what's the best approach for a web API plus React regarding authentication and authorization? Okay, that is a loaded, <laughs> super say, loaded, no. super, super, super loaded question. Um, so the generally accepted practice with a web API, and we're not really going to go into web APIs today because they add another layer of complication with the absence of user interface. Um, the, the, the probably the preferred approach with a web, a, web API and React is to, um, is to, to do like these third party authentications like we're talking about and, um, and, uh, uh, set up the token exchange on the back end. Now I'm glossing over a lot of stuff because this is something that I have to look at like actively to refresh my memory on, on a regular basis. Um, because again, I'm just a simple caveman developer. Um, <laughs> um, but but it, 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 it is beyond, I'll just say it's beyond the scope of what we're talking about today. Okay, that's good to know. Um... Okay, so I'm seeing a few questions um, about like identity versus uh, JWT uh, using web APIs. So, so uh, these are these are all topics that come in with the with the the OAuth third party authentication later on. Okay, okay, great. So we'll save those for later then. Um, all righty, and then I have one last question, and we can probably move on. Uh, can identity be used with web APIs and not uh, MVC? You know, that's a very good question. One that I don't know the answer to. Um, I, I, as I'm sitting here thinking about it, I think it probably can't because there's a lot of razor dependencies in there. Um, but I'll be honest, I've never tried. So I, I, I just don't know the answer to that one. Okay. So TBD. All righty. So uh, I think that's all the questions we have for right now. Cool. Oh, I have one more actually. Are you ready for it? Sure. Okay. All right. So would you recommend Microsoft Identity Framework for small or medium production websites? Yes, I would. Absolutely. <laughs> um, and, and this goes back to my personal preference, right? Because I, I mentioned earlier, so I'm going, I, I feel it's a little hypocritical, right? I'm going to be demonstrating the built-in Microsoft, I mean, the built-in ASP.NET Core Identity Framework, which is a great framework. Um, it, it's It's been reviewed. It's been um uh it's past security audits and and it's 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 something that i would recommend doing if you want to maintain your first party authentication um personally as a developer i love going third party i don't like managing i don't like managing credentials um and i would actually recommend that for a website of any size personally <clears throat> okay good to know for microsoft identity it is um Okay, one last one before we move on to our first workshop of the day. Uh, will managed identity be part of this talk? And I believe you kind of just answered. Not mine. Um, I don't know if managed identity comes up in the module that Matt's doing. I doubt it does. Uh, managed identity is this um, is the the ability on Azure for Azure to manage a, a, a basically a service identity. Um, to like, for example, you've got a website that has a backend SQL database and Azure can manage the, um, the identity that's used for both of those Azure resources that they run under. Um, I don't believe that's going to come up in Matt's discussion, but, um, uh, it's certainly a good question and, and that's, um, but it's a little bit outside the scope. Sure. Might be a little advanced for, for this, for this audience, but perhaps we'll touch on it when, uh, Matt comes along. Um, okay, great. So uh, I believe next you have a workshop for us, um, adding authentication and authorization to a web app using ASP.NET Core Identity, ASP.NET Core's native security framework. Yep. Okay, great. Uh, that sounds super exciting and I would love to get started. So I'll All let you right. take it away. So um, go ahead and share my screen, please. <clears throat> All right. So um, this is a Microsoft Learn module, and this URL here on the slide, you can't really see it. That's kind of a bad gray. 
on the um, on, on that backdrop. But aka.ms slash learn dash identity. Um, here, let me just I will actually give Jamie that URL on our backroom chat so she can share it out. Um, that aka.ms slash learn identity is a short URL that will take you to this Microsoft Learn module. Um, this is a Microsoft Learn module that I co-wrote originally, and I uh, recently rewrote it. Um, the, the module um, is kind of long. Uh, it, it, I, the, the timing here says about an hour and eight minutes. Um, if you take your time, it's probably more like an hour and a half, honestly. Uh, and we will not get through it all today, unfortunately. Uh, I, wish, I wish we could, but we just won't. Um, so I'm going to hop in to the introduction page. I'm going to go over just a few topics about what we're going to be doing and what you're going to learn. Um, so we're going to, right off the bat, we're going to configure identity support in an existing ASP.NET Core web app. So we're going to take an existing app, and we're just going to wire it up so we can log, cre create users and log in with them. Um, then we're going to extend those the, the identity framework. We're going to customize it in such a way that we can take additional data beyond what the what the, the boilerplate accepts from the user. Uh, you know, the, the boilerplate just expects the user to put in an email address and a username and password, I think. And we're going to also modify the app to take first name and last name. Um, that's probably about all we're going to have the time to get through. Um, the other things that this module covers that I would totally love for you to check out um, beyond, you know, the, the live stream that we're doing right now is we're going to, you can then customize the multi-factor authentication capabilities built into the identity framework. And then you're going to implement some policy-based authorization. So uh, the learn module walks you through creating a user who is an quote, administrator, and the administrator has special privileges. So um, the, the very last unit of this is about giving that administrator those special privileges. <clears throat> now, just to level set, um, I'm going to be using a lot of terms and a lot of tools that I, I, I kind of already just assume that you have some familiarity with, um, you know, the basic C-sharp tools like the .NET uh, SDK. Um, some experience with relational databases and SQL Server specifically. Um, some familiarity with Entity Framework Core. Now, the, we have another learn module out there for Entity Framework Core that I, I strongly recommend uh, that you review before you do this. Um, the reason will become clear in a little bit, but basically Entity Framework Core is a dependency for Identity Framework. And if you understand Entity Framework Core, it makes working with Identity Framework that much easier. Uh, we kind of assume that you know a little bit about Razor. And we kind of assume that you have some knowledge about timed one-time password authenticator apps. We'll talk about those a little bit later on. Um, but uh, uh, again, just like passing familiarity with like the whole concept of multi-factor authentication, right? So what kind of tools are you going to need to get through this? Well. This is, this is where it gets interesting. So the, the code that we give you at the beginning of this um, module, you could download the code on your machine, and you could run through the exercises on your machine, all on the bare metal on your machine. That's completely supported. I tested it. It works great. But one of the problems when you're writing modules like this that have dependencies, like, for example, SQL Server, is as an author, I often don't want you to have to go download SQL Server and configure it and all that if you don't already have it. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't like that. I would prefer to ship the environment. And back in the day, we used to, you know, it, it was not uncommon to maybe put together like a VM for something like this. But, um, but instead... The uh, uh, what I have done for the for the source code, the uh, sample code for this module is I've created a dev container configuration, right? So you can clone this code. And if you have a Docker environment on your machine, you can use Visual Studio Code to open it as a, you know, within a container in Visual Studio Code. And Visual Studio Code will actually build the Docker container with all of the prerequisites already configured for you. Right, so that's actually what I'm going to show you today. I'm I'm going to be doing this inside the Docker container, 
Um, and uh, I, 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 uh, I very much recommend this approach. The, this approach is, is my favorite approach because I have sh I've shipped the environment that with all the prerequisites you need. <clears throat> all right, so before we get started downloading code and all that, let's talk a little bit about the architecture uh, of ASP.NET Core Identity. Um, so we've already talked about this is the build built in, you know, boilerplate scaffolded identity framework in ASP.NET Core. It's a membership system uh, that's just purely about login capabilities and uh, authorization. Um, it also supports external providers like Facebook and Twitter, right? It this is different from doing the third party authentication with like Microsoft uh, identity platform. This is this is a third party authentication, but this is actually a function built into the ASP.NET identity framework that makes it easier for you to integrate third party logins with like Facebook and Twitter. Um, the membership data that is persisted in your app is persisted in a database. Now that database, I'm going to scroll down a little bit more. Here's here's the diagram of how uh, of how uh, the identity uh, framework works in your Razor app or your MVC app. Both both are perfectly acceptable. Um, in your app, and you implement the identity manager, like we're going to show you, it interacts with an identity store that is um, uh, 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 abstracted behind EF Core. Right now, by default, that that data store is C is SQL Server, but you can use any kind of database you want. In fact, previous versions of this module let you pick. We let you pick between SQL Server or Postgres. Now, when I rewrote this module recently, I I, I pared it down just to SQL Server just to keep more focus on the topic. But uh, you could use Postgres. Um, I can't remember. I think you can use SQLite for identity. I can't swear to that, but you can plug in, um, you can plug in lots of different database providers just into EF Core. And if you don't like EF Core, you can even pull EF Core out and replace EF Core with a different uh, ORM. So like if you want to put Dapper in there, you could, but the default is EF Core and, and SQL Server. <clears throat> So EF Core uses a feature called migrations to incrementally update the database to keep it in sync with the app's code. This is the default data schema that it builds. And we're not gonna go into great details about it, but you can see it's pretty much what you would expect, right? There's, there's roles and users and claims and tokens, um, but we can extend this and I'm gonna show you how to extend it. <clears throat> so, that's kind of just the overview before we touch the, the ASP.NET Core identity uh, platform. That brings us to a knowledge check. Um, so let's see who was paying attention. What's the default data store for identity? Is it Entity Framework Core and Postgres? Is it Dapper and SQL Server? Or is it EF Core and SQL Server? Um, do we have Jamie or John? I can't see the chat. I'm going to guess that somebody was paying attention, though. You're, you're, you're muted, Jamie. Oh, my goodness. I was like trying to add myself back to the stream, and it was not working. Um, <laughs> uh, so unfortunately, I think uh, folks in the chat got it before me. Um, but yes, I would go with C, EF Core, and SQL Server. Yep. That's Congratulations, right. everyone in the chat. You're much quicker than I am. <laughs> Apologies about that. All right, so here's the fun part. Now we're going to get into the code. So as you're stepping through this learn module, uh, again, right here at the start of the exercise, I, I, I remind you that, hey, if you want to use the dev container, that's totally an option. And I, I want to show you a really cool thing in GitHub that I just love. Um, if, if you have access to this, now it's not free. It costs like 18 cents an hour, I think. Um, don't quote me on that. I am just, I am just like, out of the out of the air, out of out of my memory, um, I think it's like eighteen cents though. You can set up what's called a code space. Now you have to set up. There's a little legwork you have to do first. Like your your uh, GitHub user has to be a member of a GitHub organization, and that organization is what gets billed for the uh, for code spaces. But what's really really cool is you can come in here into into the code. 
this might actually take a little bit because I can see that my code space went to sleep while I was talking. Um, but you can come in here to the code in, in GitHub and click the code button and you can create a code space. Um, now I have already created one and it's named Stunning Engine. Uh, Stunning Engine was running and I didn't name that by the way, that's just, it just automatically names it adjective noun. Uh, Stunning Engine was running when I started talking and then it went to sleep. I'm gonna click Stunning Engine though and hopefully, I think he's awake now. <clears throat> oh yeah, look at that. So that is that I, I just love this so much. I just in GitHub I clicked code create. I mean, I could have clicked create create code space on main, but I already have one created. But I have a, a complete environment right here in the browser. Right, I can I can build. Right, I can I have all my code. I can edit. I can do all kinds of neat stuff. And it's a full. Oh, check this out. I even have a SQL Server that's pre-configured and already running. It's all it's all there and ready to go. So the GitHub code spaces mechanism, love it, not free. All right, you have to pay for it or your organization has to pay for it. Um, but I love it, it's easy. Just go to the GitHub and you can launch it that way. If you, if you don't wanna pay and you have a Docker environment locally, um, the other option you can do, which is what I'm going to show you right now, is from the command prompt, and I know I'm gonna head off the questions about my command prompt. This is just Windows Terminal. I've customized it with some PowerShell scripts. So um, it's just plain old Windows Terminal. Um, actually, I'm gonna clone, where was it? Get clone, there it is. I'm going to clone that URL, right? That's, that's the URL we were looking at earlier uh, for the GitHub repo. It's, it's what's on the URL list. So I'm gonna clone that locally. So now I have it copied local. I'm going to type code dot. I'm going to switch to the directory and, and type code dot. And what that's going to do is that is going to open up this directory in Visual Studio Code. It'll open on another monitor. I'll bring it over here. Now, since I have Docker, it's going to think about it. And as it opens stuff and does what Visual Studio Code does on, on startup, Eventually, it's going to prompt me, and I'll show you the prompt when it prompts. Come on. Are you going to prompt me? Ah, there it prompted me. All right. So it says, hey, this folder has a dev container configuration file. Do you want to reopen it in a container? And I do want to reopen it in a container. Now, if I click that reopen in container button, it's going to take a couple of minutes to spin up the container. and um, we just don't have that kind of time. So I actually headed this off at the pass and I have another instance of Visual Studio Code where it's already created the container and we're already running in the container. So this is this is the code. This again, the starter app for my learn module running in an environment that I've packaged in a dev container. You can just run it like that, has SQL Server and everything ready to go for you. So um, with that, we can actually start on our exercise. So I'm gonna switch back over to my browser. <clears throat> so we already covered cloning the code. We already covered switching to the code and opening it in Visual Studio Code. And then we covered opening it in a, in a dev container. And if you miss the prompt, there is, uh, we call out the command that you can run in the Visual Studio Code command pa palette to, to uh, force that open. Um, all right, so we're going to open a terminal pane and we're going to switch to the Razor Pages Pizza directory. Uh, then we're gonna run it and well, we'll pick up from there. So let's switch back over to Visual Studio Code. All right, so go back over to my Explorer just so we can see all the files. We can see that in the Razor Pages Pizza folder, that's where our code is. So we'll switch over there, Razor Pages Pizza. We're gonna make sure it builds. And then I'm gonna run it. <clears throat> All right, so it's running right now in my container. Um, now the container has set up port forwarding automatically. 
so that when I, so it says right here, look at the output here on the, on the run where it says now listening on HTTPS localhost port 7192, I can just control click that. I'm going to hold control. I'm going to click that down here in the text. And it will, it actually, it, I'm pretty sure, yeah, it opened in my browser, which was behind the Visual Studio code. So I had to switch back over. So this is the app. This is the app that, that is downloaded. We've made no changes to it at all. So uh, this is this is all it is. Here's the home page, the list of pizzas that Razor Pages Pizzas sells, right? And we can add and, and remove pizzas from this list. We have the privacy policy page. That's just the boilerplate. And then remember I said there's a unit later on that um, focuses on granting administrators privileges to do certain things. For that exercise, there is a super secret admin page, right? Uh, that, that is, um, if you're not an admin, you shouldn't be seeing this page. But obviously, obviously we are seeing this page. So um, as part of the learn module, you will lock this down. All right. So uh, go back over. Actually, before I do that, let's look at our exercise again. What's next? So that's that's it. So we've looked at the pizza list. We've looked at home. Uh, now we can stop the app. So let's stop the app. And you can stop the app just by pressing in the terminal window. You press Control C, and you can see it, it, it stopped. So I'll uh, I'll even type the clear command. I have a nice clean terminal again. All right. So the very first thing that we need to do, and it shows us here, um, actually, you know what? I'm going to open this up on another monitor just so I have a guide for me to talk through. Uh, please bear with me as I find another. There we go. OK. <clears throat> so. The very first thing that we're going to do is we need we need the tools to um, to generate ASP.NET code. There, there's a .NET tool called ASP.NET Code Generator. Um, to install that .NET tool in the .NET, um, you know, for the .NET SDK, we're going to use the tool .NET uh, the command .NET tool install .NET ASP.NET Code Generator, and then I'm going to specify a version. You don't generally have to specify a version, but I'm specifying a version in this case because the container is using specific versions of everything just to make sure we have good control over the learner experience. <clears throat> Um, you see, in, in this case, in my container, the tool was already installed. Uh, you should, otherwise, you'd see a little green text that says it was successfully installed. Um, now, one question you might be thinking of right now is, okay, why are we doing this all in Visual Studio Code and with the .NET SDK and not Visual Studio? Now, Visual Studio can do everything that we're doing today in Visual Studio Code with the .NET SDK. What it can't do is dev containers. What it, so I can't yet ship the environment for Visual Studio like I can in Visual Studio Code. Um, so that was one reason why I chose Visual Studio. The other reason, uh, Visual Studio Code rather, the other reason why I chose Visual Studio Code is because it gives you the, working in Visual Studio Code with the .NET SDK gives you the fundamental knowledge of what's going on behind the scenes in Visual Studio and will equip you to develop on Windows, Linux, or Mac OS. Uh, regardless of operating system. Uh, so um, the, what you're going to learn today, even though it, code and the .NET SDK might be, you know, new and, and, and unfamiliar, uh, it, what you're going to learn today is still applicable in Visual Studio. The tools might be a little different, but the processes are all exactly the same. <clears throat> Um, all right, so we've got that tool installed. We're also going to install a series of, of uh, I'm going to bring my window back over here, a series of packages that are dependencies, NuGet packages. Now, these packages, uh, some of them are code generation templates. Some of them are dependencies. There's just a stack of them. Easiest way to do it is just copy the whole stack and, uh, and paste it into your terminal. So that's going to go for a minute. Not even a minute, a few seconds. We'll wait for it. All 
All right, that's done. So now we have everything we need to run the scaffolder and generate um, our, our identity uh, implementation. So the command for that, I'm going to clear. I'm going to clear my my terminal just so we can see it cleanly. The command for that, we're going to say .NET ASP.NET dash code generator identity. So we're generating the identity uh, code. From, from the identity templates, rather. Uh, we're going to use the default UI, and we're going to name the DB context Razor Pages Pizza Auth. So let's talk a little bit about what this command is doing. So we're invoking the identity templates from the ASP.NET code generator, and we're passing in this flag, use default UI. So that use default UI tells, um, tells the code generator that we want to use the identity Razor class library. So a Razor class library is like any other class library, except it contains Razor pages, right? Uh, they're not Razor pages that you can modify. You can override them, and we're going to show you overriding them later. But there, it's just a class library that contains pre-compiled Razor pages. So this is all just out of the box. This is no modification whatsoever. And then the last thing that we're doing is we're saying, hey, the DB context that you're going to use to talk to the database will be named Razor Pages Pizza Auth. Now, DB context is a concept from Entity Framework. It's the, uh, the, the, the gateway through which you interact with your database. Uh, it's the abstraction that, that does all of the heavy lifting. So if you're not familiar with DB context and EF Core, I'm going to, again, recommend that you, that you uh, pause right here and, and go check out our Entity Framework Core Microsoft Learn module that also uses dev containers just like this one to set up an environment. It will show you uh, some SQL Server, some uh, SQLite, and some Postgres. Uh, it, it's another one that I just rewrote recently, and I, I'm, I'm really kind of proud of it. So I, I, I certainly hope it's uh, enjoyable and informative for you. All right, so let's, let's run that command. <clears throat> So it's going to build first, and then it's going to implement those templates. It's thinking. Actually, while it's thinking, um, I do have I just had to double check. Jamie is asking for a link to share with everyone uh, about EF Core, and I happen to have it memorized. <laughs> all right, so it's built. Um, all right, so what do we do now? Uh, we, we get back to where we were before we switch to a different learn module in our browser. Um, so what what happened? We ran this template. It generated an areas uh, folder in our in our project and put some put some files in that areas folder. So it created this Razor Pages Pizza Auth.cs, and that Razor Pages Pizza Auth.cs it it inherits from Identity DB Context. Well, Identity DB Context is a base class in the Identity Framework that implements a DB Context like what we were talking about in EF Core. Um, and Razor Pages Pizza Auth in turn inherits from that, and you can see there's it's just boilerplate. This is just this is just a boilerplate uh, standard implementation of a DB context. There's there's nothing special in here, other than the one thing I will point out because it becomes relevant later on. It's it's inheriting from identity DB context of type identity user. That identity user is the default um, class used for uh used for identity we're going to customize that later we're going to replace it with a different class but that's later <clears throat> all right so let's look at what else it did so over here in program.cs at the very top it kind of made a mess and this is one of my one complaint about the about this code generator is it it, it makes a little bit of a mess and it doesn't it uses lots of semicolons, which is, are perfectly valid in C-sharp, but then it doesn't follow those semicolons with a line feed character. So I'm going to come in here, and I'm going to add some line feeds to make it more readable. And in fact, if, you, if, you, um, if you're looking at the Learn module right now, 
even in parentheses right above this code, I, I even say I've reformatted this for readability. It's just because the, the template relies on those semicolons without line feeds. But now it's a little bit more readable. So let's see what we did. So it added it added um, a few it added a few uh, uh, using statements at the top to to bring in some of our um, to resolve some of our references, and it also added our Razor Pages Pizza Off uh, DB context as a uh, registered it in the de uh, dependency injection framework as a service, along with the use SQL Server option and the connection string. Um, and it added the default identity to the uh, depend, uh, dependency injection, uh, registered in dependency injection to be used with um, the, uh, you know, to be used with our Razor Pages app. And uh, also added the entity framework store as, a, uh, um, as an option to that. So that's, that's, what, that's what it did. That's, that's all it did. Oh, I take it back, it did one other thing. It added a line right down here, this use authentication. That's super important. App.use authentication uh, uh, adds the, you know, uh, Microsoft identity uh, platform, uh, not Microsoft identity platform, uh, the ASP.NET Core identity framework adds it to the pipeline. Uh, so we haven't done anything so far other than run the scaffold. Just to be clear, this is all stuff the scaffold did for us. All right, so you, I, I mentioned earlier that we're wired up to a SQL Server database. Uh, one thing that we need to do now is we need to set the connection string. Um, now, I'm going to point out very briefly, if I scroll down to this part where we talk about configuring the database connection with the connection string, as of streaming right now, and in fact, it's probably going, it may have just gotten fixed uh, in in the current publish, we publish at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific and like 4 p.m. Pacific. So it might be fixed now since the last time I refreshed this page. But um, we discovered a typo last night. Uh, there are a couple of spots in this module where I accidentally have the the term Razor Pages Pizza Identity DB Context instead of Razor Pages Pizza Auth. You can see why I shortened it. I just screwed up and didn't updated everywhere. We fixed it last night and it should be published. Like it might even be published right now. Uh, but definitely for future viewers of this recording, it should be fixed by the time you see it. Anyway, we come back over here and we, we just looking at the instructions, which connection string do we need? Well, I'm not running locally, right? So uh, let's hop over back over here to my app settings. I'm not running locally. I'm running in a container. Well, by default, it's going to enter the, the 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 default connection string for local DB, right? I'm not running local DB. I'm I'm running like full SQL Server in my container. So I'm going to get that connection string from from the learn module. Just to be clear, I'm talking about the second one here, the one that says if you're running in the container, all right. So that's if you're running in the container, whether in Visual Studio Code or uh, GitHub Code Spaces you're going to use the second connection string. Just don't name it Razor Pages Pizza Identity DB whatever, right? Um, just grab the connection string there. Plug it in. Uh, make sure you have the right number of quotes and that it is a valid JSON file. Save it. Make sure I got my program.cs saved. <clears throat> all right, so those are all the changes that we needed to make to the actual app. So we ran our scaffold. We have implemented identity. The one thing that we need to do is we need to we need to create the database, right? We need to set up the database. Now, Entity Framework Core makes this really easy with a with a process called migrations. Now, again, I'm not going to go into migrations, but basically it's the the, the idea that we're going to take the, the codes idea of what the entity model looks like, and we're going to translate it into an actual database schema and implement it. And to do that, we need uh, another tool, right? We installed the, um, we installed the ASP.NET code generator tool earlier. So um, now we install the .NET EF tool. Uh, and I'm, I'm hearing, by the way, I'm going to switch back over to my browser. 
a little birdie just told me, oh, look at that. While I was talking, our updates got published. So hopefully I won't need to make that call out again, right? Um, it, it, the, the, the update that I was talking about is, is live, so we can, we can scrap everything I said earlier. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> we installed the .NET EF tool. And now with the .NET EF tool, we are going to create a migration. Uh, if you uh, are familiar with EF, you, you're familiar with this command, .NET EF migrations add. So that creates a new migration, and we're going to name the migration create identity schema. <clears throat> and it's going to build, and then after it builds, it will generate some, uh, some code that we can look at very briefly. All right, so it generated our migrations. Um, we won't go into this migration in any great detail, but I just wanted to show you that the, the migration code is, is literally building a database, right? It's, it's all about, it's all about uh, creating the tables. Um, all right. So now let's apply let's apply that uh, let's apply that migration with the .NET EF database update command. Build started, build succeeded, and then we're going to see a whole bunch of stuff fly by. Um, oh, it looks like I already deployed that in this container. So um, it actually threw an error at me, uh, which is surprising uh, because I thought I was using a new container this morning. But uh, oh, well, it is what it is. Um, let's hop over here to the to the database, I have a. If you're in the container, you will also have the extension for SQL Server pre-installed. So there's a SQL Server extension right over here. That's what it looks like. Uh, we go to the SQL Server extension and we can browse our database. So there's the Razor Pages Pizza database, and there's that schema we saw earlier, right, with the the user tables and the roles and all that. So we actually have a database now. And um, the only other thing that we need to do is, if you remember. Come back over here to the app. We don't have any login link on the app, right? There's no, there's nothing, there's nothing there. So the one last thing we need to do is we need to add that. And this is the only code change that we've done. Is if we go to, if we go to the layout, where's the layout? Dig down into pages, shared uh, layout.cshtml. Um, in layout.cshtml. I have put a comment for you where I think you might like to add this login partial view that was created. This login partial view, this was created by the scaffolder. This is basically your login link, right? This is if you're signed in, it's going to say, uh, if you're not logged in, well, hold on. If you're logged in, it's going to say, hello, username, get username, right? Uh, if you're not logged in, it's going to show register and login links. So we're just going to add that to the layout. And, and I have already commented it for you there. So all you have to do is just replace that comment with that login partial. So make sure everything's saved since we're going to be saving, uh, since we're going to be building manually. Make sure everything's saved. And at this point, we can .NET build and run. I'm just going to .NET run. All right, so we're running again. I'll just switch back over to my previous tab for the app and hit refresh. Oh, so I'm already logged in, it looks like. Let's log out. Um, all right, so here's the home page for the app. You see we have register and login links now. So we could, we could register. And I could say I'm going to register as cool user at contoso.com. <clears throat> so 
So at this point, we need to confirm the email address. Now, the default implementation for identity doesn't have any way to send email. So it's like, okay, look, in a real world, you need to do, you need to implement this. But for, for the purposes of the scaffold, we have just made it so all you have to do is click this link. So we're going to click this link. Now we're confirmed. So now we can go log in as cool user at contoso.com. And there we are. Hello, cool user at contoso.com. Now I'm running even shorter on time than I thought I was going to be at this point because it's kind of a broad topic. Um, what I'm going to do at this point, since I'm, I'm running kind of down on, on code, is I'm going to fly through just talking over the next sections um, and leave it as an exercise for the viewer to complete this module on your own. Um, I, it, like I said, it'll take you about an hour and 10, maybe an hour and a half. Um, but, but it's full of great use, great information, and we're going to step through it uh, now. <clears throat> um, so the next part talks about customizing the identity model that I just showed you. Remember I showed you identity user um, is, is you know, where we're implementing that DB context and it's inheriting from uh, identity DB context of type identity user. Uh, we would actually extend identity user to replace it with a Razor Pages pizza user. And what that Razor Pages pizza user does, I'll just hop through and look at the code. What that Razor Pages pizza user does is it adds the first name and last name properties to the class. Now, you remember I mentioned earlier, though, that all of this functionality that we see in the boilerplate implementation comes out of a Razor class library. That Razor class library doesn't have any code that's just like exposed to us by default because it's all coming out of a DLL. So we have to actually run, if we come back up here to the top of the module again, we actually have to run the identity uh, scaffold again. And this time we give it a list of files that we want it to generate. Now the command that I give you actually gives a pretty pretty full list. So we're gonna we're going to include the enable authenticator page because we're going to modify that for multi-factor authentication. We're going to include the manage index. So that's for, for changing your username or changing your email address, changing your first name and last name once we add that capability. Um, and then we're going to actually implement a, a email confirmation. Now, for purposes of, of this module, I'm going to scroll down. The way that email confirmation works is when it gets to that confirmation page, it goes to the dependency injection service and says, hey, give me an email sender type. So what you're going to do in this module is you're going to implement um, I email sender, right, later on. So the, all, just like, listen, this is all about what I've talked about so far, about extending that identity user. Uh, I'm showing you how, how it looks when you make the change to the database. That's all handled for you by migrations. All you have to do really to change the app is add the first name and last name fields to a few forms. So that's really all the modifications you're going to do in the app at that point. Um, do, 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 scroll down, scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. We get to the part where we can conf configure the confirmation email sender. I want to call this out. So if you look at that register.cshtml.cs that's generated by the scaffold, it generates this line of code. It says send email async, and it passes in the email address. It passes in the subject, and then it passes in the body encoded as HTML. For purposes of this module, I'm like, no, I'm not going to make you send email. I'm not going to make you set up an SMTP server and do all that jazz. I'm just going to have you write your email out to the console, out to the terminal in Visual Studio Code so you can see that URL. So we, we change that line of code to get rid of the HTML encoding because that breaks things. And then we implement an email sender that just does exactly what I talked about. It just writes that confirmation out to the terminal so you as the developer who's testing this can confirm your email address. And then the very last thing that we do on this, this page is we, we add that email sender service to the dependency injection container so identity can find it. So then we run through all that. And um, yeah, basically this whole unit, you've added first name, last name, uh, first name and last name to the user registration and made the according, you know, the, 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 the corresponding UI changes. 
and uh, then you implement the email sender. Now, in a real world environment, your email sender is going to connect to an SMTP service or some web service like a Twilio or MailChimp or whoever. Um, but this is this is the kind of like the bare minimum of what you need to do to get the link sent to you privately in your development environment. All right. So after we get through this, then we get to do something fun, right? One of my one of my favorite things to play with because I get to play with an app on a phone. And that's multi-factor authentication. Um, multi-factor authentication is, uh, um, first of all, I'm going to say that it's something that you absolutely should be doing in all of your apps. Okay, It's when we uh, prompt for additional forms of identification so that we are combining um, more than one and enhancing the security to be really sure you are who you say you are, because that's the point of authentication is making sure you are who you say you are. So these things include things like something you know, like a password or a security question, something you have, like a hardware token or a USB, like a YubiKey thing, or something you are, like a fingerprint or a retina scan or a face scan. Um, the most effective way to do MFA is when you combine these different categories of authentication. So like a lot of banks, for example, like to do just security questions in addition to your username and password. Well, that's just something you know twice. And it's actually not too hard to defeat that, right? So, uh, an adversary can get information about you know things that you know it's much harder for somebody sitting in a sitting you know in a basement halfway around the world to get your information your personal information and use that against you than it is to get something like your phone or your hardware token or your 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 fingerprint they can't get those so it's the the best security implements one from both of those categories now the the timed-based one-time password is arguably one of the best mechanisms for uh, something you have. The, the process is basically um, we generate a token and we give you that token and you take that token and you store that token in an app on your phone. And then from now until the end of time, whenever you open that app on your phone, it does a little math with that token and it generates a six-digit uh, a six-digit code. And the only way you can generate that six digit code at that moment in time is with the token that you were given way back when you set up multi-factor authentication. Um, Time-based one-time password is built into uh, ASP.NET Core Identity. It's implemented right off the bat. All you have to do is, I, I think even if, if I think my app is still running, let's hop over. I can go, I believe all I have to do yeah, I can set it up right now. I can add my authenticator app. But if we go in there, you see it doesn't give me a QR code, right? It just gives me this 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 token. It's just this this key that I could type in. Well, that's no fun. We don't want to make our users type all that. So we want to give them a QR code. Now we have docs on how to generate the QR code, right? And our doc shows you how to do it with a JavaScript library. I took my own tactic for this Microsoft Learn module, and I showed everybody how to do it with. Let's, where am I? I have too many browsers open. I'm drowning in browsers. <clears throat> so I show you how to do it with a, a third party library, right? I found an open source library out there on NuGet called QR Coder. And we, we have you generate the QR code on the server and then inject it into the Razor page as base 64. So that's fun, and it's kind of a different take on what you might have seen in the documentation. Um, I, I personally would prefer this approach, but again, it's up to you as a developer. Uh, so we, we, we customize multi-factor authentication. One other point that I want to bring up before we before we leave multi-factor authentication, we everyone has experienced SMS text messages as a form of, of uh, multi-factor authentication. Um, this is just me getting on my soapbox as a... Uh, security hobbyist, um, that's bad. Um, the, the SMS text messages are the most common alternative to timed one-time passwords, but they are unfortunately relatively easy for an adversary to defeat. Um, it, it's, it's not that hard for, for a determined adversary to clone your SIM and, and go to town. So um, SMS codes are not considered a secure form of MFA, and and um, and it's recommended that you not use that in your app that you not use them as uh, multi-factor authentication. 
All right, so the last unit of this module covers authorization. And we talk, we've talk we already talked about authentication versus authorization. Authentication is who you are. Authorization is what you're allowed to do. Um, and we talk about claims and policies. Claims describe a user. This user is an administrator. This user is... Um, is just a regular user. This user is a limited user. This user is allowed to update this type of record. Um, these are claims that you can make, like on a government ID. Your government ID makes claims about your attributes, makes claims about your age, about your type of the type of vehicle you're allowed to drive. Um, the uh, those attributes are used in enforcing a policy. And we give an example about bars and taverns, right? If you go to a bar and you order an adult beverage, the bartender is looking at your credentials and they observe the claim on that ID of the birth date. Oh, well, you're 21 is generally the legal drinking age in the U.S. You're 21. Well, according to the policy, you're allowed to have the drink. Um, so that's what a policy is. We're going to check knowledge real quick. And again, I'm running short on time, so I'm just going to fly through this. Which of the following is a true statement? There can be no authentication without authorization. There can be no authorization without authentication. Or claims describe what a subject can do. I know this one. <laughs> um, so it is, uh, there can be no authorization without authentication. Correct. Before we can be concerned with what a subject can do, we have to first know who they are. Exactly. <clears throat> so the very last unit of this learn module, and again, I'm going to talk over this and, and leave it as an exercise for you, but I really recommend it. I'm really proud of, 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 of this learn module and, and what it contains. Um, we secure some pages. So we use the authorize attribute. Just by adding the authorized attribute to the to the to the razor page, the pizza razor page uh, class, um, that page will require you to be logged in before you can view it. So that's the very first thing we do. We add the authorized attribute, and now you can't get to the pizza page unless you're logged in. But then we take it a step further, right? Then we we um, modify the pizza. Uh, list page to um, to check to see if a user has a claim that, that denotes them as an administrator. And if they're an administrator, we make some UI choices and, and we do some uh, we do some other stuff to prevent them from doing things that we don't want them to do. Um, but essentially we give them the ability to add pizzas and delete pizzas if they're an administrator. Um, finally, we add a policy that says, Admin administrators, you have to be an administrator to get to the admins only page. So a regular user can get to the pizza list, but they can't modify the pizza list. An administrator can both get to the pizza list, modify the pizza list, and get to the admins only page. And we implement that um, as, as, both, as a policy that is, is implemented. Um, we require the claim is admin equals true. Uh, we step through it. Um, again, this is all just some, uh, some little UI changes. Uh, the way we the way we actually define a character uh, a character a user as an administrator is we um, we add a flag to the to the configuration that says okay if a user registers with admin at contoso.com then that person is an admin and give them the admin claim. Uh, however, you determine permissions will ultimately be up to you. But this is just the way we chose to do it for this module. And um, then we run through and we test it all again and we, we have our admin user that can do his admin things. And that is the whirlwind tour of the ASP.NET Core Identity Microsoft Learn module. Um, again, I recommend it. I recommend the dev container scenario because that way you don't even need to worry about setting up SQL Server. Um, I also recommend the EF Core uh, Learn module we talked about earlier. Ooh, that was awesome, Cam. <laughs> I know that was a lot of information to cover. Uh, you did do a very great job. Um, for those following along, please feel free to head on over to that Learn module uh, so that you can walk through it on anything that we kind of rushed through. Um, community member Cecil, 
Uh, Phillips also mentioned that maybe we should do another, <laughs> a second uh, learn module on this. So uh, thanks for the feedback, Cecil. Um, we do have a few questions that I really want to get to uh, with you before we jump on over to the next workshop. Uh, so if you're ready, I'm ready. Go for it. All right. So first question we have. So uh, would you rather start with authentication and or authorization from the start or afterwards and add it in when the first version of the system is ready? So that's an interesting question, and I could see both approaches being valid, but um, I, I, would, I would recommend, like, before you do anything else, deciding on what your authentication and authorization is going to look like in your app and, and make that the very first thing you tackle. Uh, and that's just my recommendation as, as a developer. Reason being, then as you add functionality at every step, um, uh, every step that you add functionality, you are forced to think about authentication and authorization. Because if you don't do that, if you do it the other way, if you do all your functionality first and then go back and bolt on authentication and authorization, what happens is you're going to miss something and you're going to leave, you're going to leave holes. Um, so don't do that. Start with authentication and authorization. Make sure that you're thinking about it in every step of, of your application and, um, definitely do security code reviews. Um, and and find find a security expert to to review your code and and beat against it a little bit. Okay, thank you. That's good advice. Okay, next question: uh, Can I customize user model and delete email property uh, and other properties that I don't need? Um, Deleting the email property, I can't, I, I wouldn't actually delete anything from the boilerplate. I would only add, right? Everything that's, that's, um, that is, is in the boilerplate. I, I would, I would consider as being required. I wouldn't be surprised if there's a way to pull email out and just use like a username. Cause that's the way it used to work a few versions back. Mm. Um, but, uh, don't hold me to that. <laughs> okay. Uh, so a few questions around this. Um, so why code generator? Notice you're using that a lot. So that's just the, the, that's just the way the scaffold is implemented. Now, if you're, if you're not using the .NET SDK and Visual Studio code, um, and you're using Visual Studio, Visual Studio has what they call, um, what is the term? Just scaffold new, scaffold something, scaffolded items. That's what it is. You right click on somewhere in the project and you add new scaffolded item. That's what the menu item says. That add new scaffolded item is actually using, remember those dependencies we installed, uh, those, those NuGet packages that we installed early on and we said uh, these are required for the scaffolding, right? The scaffolding in Visual Studio uses those exact same um, dependencies and those exact same templates in those, in those class libraries. Um, the only difference is in the .NET S using the .NET SDK at the command line, we need the code generator tool to, you know, to actually consume those classes, whereas Visual Studio can do it natively. Uh, automatically. Okay. Okay, great. So it's already right in there for you. It's in the documentation. It's in the learn module. So mm -hmm. that's why that's a, it's a good use and a good tool. Okay. I think I have one more question for you, Cam. Um, so, uh, if you have a profile page, uh, you should be able to edit the fields. Does that mean you have authority to edit users in general, including other users? No. So the, the, the identity implementation, when you go to the profile page and we can, I, I don't want to dig around in the code because it would lead to those awkward moments where somebody's digging around in code and you're like, ah, what are they trying to show me? But the... <laughs> When you go to the profile page, it is loading just your user and just your user is allowed to see just your user. Um, you could build an, uh, some kind of administrator functionality to administer users, but to my knowledge, that's not part of the identity implementation. All righty. Uh, well, that's all of the questions we have uh, or for now, uh, but feel free to post your questions in the chat should something come up or you have questions on further on for Kim. Um, and, we'll and save the, some and, time at the end for And questions. now that I'm not now that I'm not presenting, I'll hop into the YouTube chat too. Oh, perfect. So we'll have Cam in there in the chat answering those as well. 
All right. Well, thank you so much, Cam. That was awesome. We'll bring you back to the end. All right. And next up, uh, managing multiple roles. Okay, there we go. Uh, hey, Matt, how's it going? I'm doing well, Jamie. How are you? I am great. I am very well. Thank you so much for joining us uh, here today. Um, it was a little bit of a last minute transition, but we are so excited to have you here uh, as our expert for this. And I, I would love to know more um, about the workshop that you're about to. Sure. Yeah. So thanks for having me, Cam. That was a great job. And um, as you can see, that identity is very nuanced. It's very complex. It's very complicated. And especially when you're doing it, the ASP.NET Core, you kind of get to see it from the bottom up. And so what we're going to talk about here is doing it with um, what we call the Microsoft Identity Platform, which Cam alluded to before, which is the, as he was mentioning, the third party um, stuff where we get to integrate the cloud. And so I do a lot of, um, I'm a cloud advocate. And so I'm all about the cloud. And so we get to introduce things like Azure Active Directory or Azure B2C and Azure B2B and all that other good stuff. So that's what we're going to talk about today is bringing that, the cloud goodness into our web apps. So yeah. Great. Yeah, let's get started. So learn the basics of Microsoft identity, including the different types of tokens, account types, and supported technologies. Great. Perfect. Um, let's get started, and I will let you take that away. Cool. All right. So I got my slides full screen, so I can't see what's going on anywhere. However, we have a bunch of prerequisites, right? And I'm going to change those. I'm going to change those right here because OAuth, authentication flows, terminologies, ASP.NET on the core level, all that other stuff, really the only thing you have to have here is a desire to learn. There is a bunch of stuff that we'll cover and we'll go through it all at the, we won't get too intricate, but we'll introduce what all the terms were, but this is crazy. Like authentication flows and the terminologies all going into it, that's just really, that's a lot to know. And just by going over what CAM stuff was, you can see it's really, really um, easy to get a lot of stuff thrown at you. So I'm gonna try to keep it simple as possible. So we'll gloss over a lot of the details, but hopefully ask in the chat, Jamie, feel free to interrupt. We'll try to, I'll try to keep it top level, but we'll go down to the details as much as we can. So with that said, we are gonna be covering the um, the Microsoft, Intro to Microsoft Identity Learn or Microsoft Identity Platform Learn module. You can get at that module with the AKA MS link. I saw Cam's was Learn Dash Identity. So I hopped out while he was talking and created a new one called Learn Dash More Dash Identity. Two workshops, two AKA MSs. You're going to learn a ton of identity today. All right. So, what is the Microsoft Identity Platform? It's an evolution of Azure Active Directory developer platform. So really, it's just the next iteration of it. And it's better, and it has a whole lot more to it. So let's kind of think about where everybody's coming from. So right now, we're not just locked in. We just don't go into the office, and they lock the door, and we're just using our computers inside a room, <laughs> like, like in Severance, where you have to go down the elevator, and that's it. Here we can be like in this room, I'm in the office at home, or we can be at a coffee shop, or you can be in the real office, or you can be working you know, at the beach or something like that. So you're all over the place. So you're not necessarily in the same place at once, right? And, and you could have vendors accessing your network. You could have little devices act accessing your network. You could be going out with your network and accessing things like Dropbox or going out and accessing like Stripe or anything like that. So you have just a whole bunch of different things accessing all at once, right? And so how do you keep them all straight? And that's what uh, I, Microsoft Identity about. It's like creating this control plane over things. And so it's way to in, um, handle your partners and customers who need to come in and have an identity your employees need to have an identity. Your cloud apps need to have an identity. You need to control them all together. And that's what the identity platform helps you do. And even better, when you think about this, is um, this is a great, great uh, event diagram, as they call, where you have the users, 
you have the resources and you have the policies. And when you wrap them all together, that's the identity. So the users are people, me, you. They could also be things like the like a device trying to get in. The resources are what they're trying to get to. And the policies like Cam mentioned before, like when you're going out and you want to um, have a, have like a drink at a, at a bar, you have to have it. You have to meet the certain. You have to meet the the drinking age. You have to be 21 in order to do that, or you have to be 16 in order to drive a car. That's so that's what the policy is. And so make sure that those are all enforced. That's where the identity overlaps. Now something super super interesting here is the policies, especially now nowadays, where you might be accessing a resource that is via a phone. You might have little less uh, policy restrictive policy via that. So I'm using my phone and I want to access a Microsoft email off of that. Well, it lets me access the email, but it's not going to let me access something on SharePoint. So the policy is different versus what I can do over my laptop where the policy is going to be a little bit more expansive. So the policy is limited based on the device I'm using for the resources I want. And this identity platform can handle all that for you. So it's abstracting all the, um, things I can do. So let's talk about then that first circle, the top circle is the, the users. And so you can handle those users in three different ways. There is a Azure Active Directory in the cloud, and that's the, like the enterprise, the inter, internal users um, portion of it. And there's business to business um, Active Directory. So that means Microsoft users have to go out and talk with um, Contoso users. And so we can create an active directory so we can have trust between those two organizations. And then there's business to consumer or B2C. And look at this, my slides are just not working today. B2C. All right. And we can have B2C. And what that means is that you can go, me, my, my business, Microsoft, I can set up an account. Microsoft's a bad, my, my previous business, Code Mill Technologies. I could have an Azure Active Directory and I can have a business or consumer facing app. And that consumer facing app then, I could have anybody log in like with their GitHub account or with their um, Facebook account or with, 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 with Google account. And then with that account, that's their now identity into the resource I wanna provide them as consumers. So now I don't actually have to like camera showing or taking care of everything internally with, with the uh, database, I don't have to do that. I'm going to let Google or GitHub take care of, you know, remembering the passwords for me. I now get like credentials passed over that way. So we won't get down to the nitty gritty of how that's um, taken care of, but there is a way we can do that, create a consumer facing app, have people log in with their consumer accounts and handle it that way. But we don't have to care about actually handling their credentials so to speak. All right, then there are the resources for things. So the resources are essentially your apps, right? And the apps yourself can use the um, Microsoft Graph, which pretty much tells you everything that you want to know about whether your app or your users through um, Active Directory. So it's, we'll, we'll take a look at the, what the graph can do. And it's a way to then show them different uh, things of your data. So let's say a good thing about um, the, what the resource, resources can do with the Microsoft Graph is, let's say I wanted to create an app that sends email emails out based on like when you log in or a background process. I can do all of that with the graph and uh, utilize uh, Office 365 to do that. So that whole resource um, picture here is able to do that via policies. And so policies is a, is a trust um, setup like I talked about before, where based on what resources you want, based on who you are, is what you can do. So whether it's the driving age or anything else that could be possibly restricted, if you pass the policy, then you can do it. And it could be based off of what you want to do in the particular context that you want to do it to. There's a lot going on, right? And it's really hard 
to control. There's just a bunch of what have yous and everything is really nuanced and subtle. And that's why we do have things like the identity platform and these huge backing applications, these services like Active Directory and um, B2B and B2C behind it to help us out. So now let's get into talking some more terms. So we have first off our tokens. So this the tokens are really about how we go through both getting, um, IDing who we are and getting at things. So the first one is the identity token or the ID token. And so that's what's gonna happen. You're gonna get an ID token, you log in, you enter your username, password, you're gonna get an identity token back. When I say you, I mean your application. So your application gets an identity token of whoever's trying to log in back. Now, if it's in a B2C scenario, same deal. They log in with their identity provider, they go through GitHub, you get that ID token. So you get an ID token saying who they are. So it's, it's, for our purposes, it's the same thing. Just think of it as if they're logging in through um, your app, username, password. When they want to get in to um, APIs that are protected by Azure AD, you use an access token to do that. And that's the authorization portion. So ID tokens, authentication, I am who I am. Authorization, getting that access token, I wanna do something, is the second portion of things. Now we get to more of our terms. Open ID Connect versus OAuth 2.0, all that other stuff. So when we're building an app, you're, you're gonna hear about all this stuff. So Open ID Connect is what I, the identity platform uses to get ID tokens. And you, you'll see a lot of things that are abbreviated OIDC, that's Open ID Connect. When you, when you see that, just keep that in the back of your mind. So when you when you see that, that's what is being talked about. The Open ID Connect protocol extends the OAuth 2.0 protocol. So that's another thing to keep in the back of your mind when you hear Open ID Connect. It's a child essentially of and inherits from OAuth 2.0. So it's things get confusing going on, which is why use a library that implements them. Don't create it yourself. Uh, as Cam mentioned in, in the previous uh, workshop, he a lot of times you just go with something that somebody else did, like a Microsoft authentication library. It's been well tested. People <laughs> know what they're doing, who created it. Don't go down to the bare wire and try to implement something that um, to the open ID spec that's, you'll get something wrong. Let, let somebody who's done it before, um, been well tested out in the real world. So use a library that implements it and go off in, based off of that. So Microsoft Authentication Library for our purposes of .NET developers is the one that we would, um, we, we would go with. All right, so overall, here's the flow that we would um, go with. And there's more to it than this, because I know we were talking about getting refresh tokens and everything um, about that before. But sign in, get an identity token, an ID token. Now, ultimately, we want to access some resources. From that, we're going to specify some policies that we want to get after. We get our access token, and then we get at the resources. So this essentially is called a flow. Overall, and there's a lot more what have yous and subtleties involved with this, but overall, this these are like the steps, the five steps you can think of overall in the flow. A lot of times, when if you have an I, if you've already gotten an access token at one point, you might be able to get a refresh token without specifically asking for it again, and that's like it's already been cached by the library that you're using, and then you can kind of skip the step between ID token and resources, you already had it. So you don't necessarily even have to go through this whole thing again, but the library is gonna take care of that for you. So it's already there, you don't have to think about it. But overall, this is the steps that you're gonna go through and like the first time that you wanna log in. All right, so now what we're gonna go through is take a look at some different types of tokens based off of the Learn module. So let's see what I have all queued up here. All right, so this here 
is the module that we're working with, is the Getting Started with Microsoft Identity. Um, the AKA MS is, uh, I totally forgot it already, but it's Learn More Identity, I think it is. And uh, we'll put it in the, in the show notes for this. But we're going to go down for the first one here, different types of tokens used in Microsoft Identity. And the first thing you'll know is this is a let's learn.net and we're going to create a node.js web application. I was <laughs> as confused as anybody else could be, but there's a reason we're going to do it like this. And that's because it's actually really interesting to go through and seeing it done this way with a node because you can one, see how nice that visual studio or uh, that a uh, .NET makes it for you. And two, because .NET bakes in a lot of this goodness that we'll see having to be done manually with Node. So, and essentially that's why we're gonna go through it and do it with JavaScript first, because it nice it explains out and you can see how everything has to happen essentially manually first. So what I am going to do then is just copy the commands in to build up our website. So npm init run through, and then I'm going to install express which is essentially just my web and then i can open it up in code which i have right here let's go down to projects and this is going to be in let's learn.net let's learn.net x1 there we go all right and so loads right up we can see visual studio code already identifies everything as um that we're running as a node project and like cam uh, did in the first portion of this uh, of the show we're using code i'm running on a mac and it's mainly so we can all see kind of like the, at the bare metal and how we it would implement everything by hand Visual Studio does give us a lot of nice um, um, shortcuts. And I think it's well worthwhile to actually see how things are written out. Go to Visual Studio and everything's taken care of for you, which is awesome. But it's nice to see how things um, work by hand. All right, so the first thing we want to do as we um, um, create things up is just all we're doing is here is the the server file, which is essentially just starting up our server here, which is going to eventually just send over an index.html file on uh, line 14 here on a git. So that's that's all that this is doing, nothing too interesting there. And it's being served on port 3007. The interesting thing is that when we create that index.html file, All right, but now we have it coming up. And so one thing I wanna call out is that we are going to use this msal browser JavaScript library. So that's the thing I was kind of alluding to before. It's the third party in Microsoft's case, the first party um, authentication client. So just calling it out, importing it in here. And then otherwise, this is just gonna say, you know, this is the Microsoft library for mcell.js exercise and has a button to sign in. And once it signs in, it's going to do um, show us various things about us. And when I say about us, about the account. And we're going to set up an application for this within Azure Active Directory. So our account within Azure Active Directory. Cool. So right now it is uh, just that welcome message. So I will make that a little bit smaller overall. And then here, there's not much to, we're just detecting which version of uh, Edge we are running on. I'll get to this config soon, but, and here to get who we are, we have to talk to graph. And this is just uh, defining what the graph endpoint is and then what the scopes are that we're asking for. And the scopes pretty much are saying, what permissions do we want 
or what policies essentially. So just user.read. So we don't have to worry about that really yet. We'll get there. So what we're going to go through here then next is to start adding our, our, our functions and our JavaScript functions. And so I will do that. The copy paste into a VS code from uh, our learn modules doesn't do the indenting very well. But the first one is uh, just to update the user interface, which does exactly that. It just changes the login button from sign in to sign out and pops in a, a username. So nothing really too fancy there. In fact, we don't do that until after we get something back there. So the next one that we do though is this one's a little more interesting for us in that it's acquire and token, acquire token and get user. Great. And you know what? I'm going to just start entering all of these in because it'll make more sense then. So I can just talk through them all while we have them. And so it explains the learn module. They explain step by step what's going on. And that's what I will do eventually. But I like just having everything in here first so I can talk through it and we can just jump back and forth between the functions. All right. Indent. All right, here we go. So what happens here is on our sign in click of the button, it's going to call sign in. And then sign in is down here. And so this MCEL application is from that library that I talked about that we imported before. So it's where, where Cam was showing you how, how everything was done by hand before. We're, we're, we're farming that out. We're letting somebody else do that. In this case, the MCEL library. And this login type pop-up versus login redirect, that's all based off of which uh, browser you're using. Um, so really what we're going to do is that we're going to log in with the pop-up here. And so if we are running, let's just show it real quick. Where is it? Right here, if we were running Internet Explorer, we would do redirect. But since we're going to be running an edge, we're going to be doing a pop up. So right there. All right. So we sign in. We're going to be doing a pop up. And so we're going to tell MCEL show a pop up screen with our graph config object, which is up here. The one I talked about before it gives me an endpoint and then what scopes I want to send over to it. Pass that over, and then we handle the response when it comes back. And so then handle response is right here. It gets past that, um, a login response, coming back from Azure AD here. All right, so right there, we sent it off. We did login pop-up, pops up, they enter username, password. We essentially now have handed things off beyond our application. We are letting MCEL do it. It's going to display, a set, really, it's going to display another web page that's being served from Azure Active Directory at this point, where we can log in and it's going to do its stuff, including two factor authentication if, if it needs to, out of our control until this handle response comes back with a login response on it. So if it's if it's not now, we're going to get the um, account username is on it. 
if it is now we're going to go through and this is kind of specifics of what um m cell is all about how it goes through and you can get all the accounts because you could have more than one account on your um, logged in at one time we won't worry necessarily how to uh do all that right now however just know that once active directory is done with it you get the handle response back and then you can update your user interface and then we can do acquire and get token. So the update user interface just shows the name, gets that username variable and, and updates that. And then acquire token and get user is when we call out to Microsoft Graph right here. So again, the request is our graph config object this time. Again, request obj. And then what we're going to do is we're going to call the mcell applica application, get account by username. That's our request account. And then acquire token silent, if we can do that. Let me bump this in. This is our refresh access token. Do we already have it or do we have to ask for it? And this by passing in this request object, we're saying, do we have the appropriate uh, permissions for it that we want based off of that user.read that was in the scrap config before? If so, very cool. Let's just call this get user from MS graph function. If not, we need to do a user interaction authentication again. So it's like login type, pop up the login and go through that whole, whole thing again. All right, assuming we do have the access token, we get it. Now we're just gonna call off to MS Microsoft Graph and pull back everything. So we're just calling here, we're setting a bearer token or setting the bearer uh, author authorization header, the bearer as our uh, access token that we have. So I hope that may, I kind of br uh, breeze right through that. Essentially though, authenticate M cell shows a, a different web page outside of our application, right? That web page originates from Azure AD. Azure AD comes back with a bunch of, we logged in successfully, comes back with a bunch of information, including an access token that lets us go get, go and get additional information, which in this case is from the Microsoft Graph. And the Microsoft Graph information, we're just gonna be pulling down a bunch of information about ourselves from it. So that's what's all going on. Identity first, ID token, and second, we get our access token and away we go. All right. But then we have to set up Azure AD in order to let us do our thing. We have to let Azure AD model our application, essentially. How do we do that? Well, there is a, there's the hard way and the easy way. <laughs> the easy way is going to, where's the website URL? Right here aad.portal.azure.com kind of brings you right into where you need to go. Otherwise you kind of would have to hunt through a bunch of different steps to get to this, but this kind of brings you right to the admin center. So you hit that and then you'd go to the Azure AD and then there should be within here app registrations. And so when you get to there, you can see all the apps that you have registered for yourself that you that you've registered, your owned applications. All applications would be across the entire Microsoft tenant, which you don't want to see because there's probably a lot of them. So I'll hit new registration and we'll do let's learn Friday. And then we can say what account types we want to have log in. So this is where I was getting at before, whether it's uh, just Azure AD. So just right here, you need to have a Microsoft account type to log in or maybe any organizational directory. So this is where B2B kind of gets in this right here. Or, or this third one down here, accounts in any organizational directory, including personal Microsoft accounts. So like Skype or Xbox, or yeah, even if you had Hotmail, or if you just wanted it limited to personal Microsoft accounts only. We'll keep it at the first one. All right, and let's just register it right now. Let's learn Friday. 
So what we're doing within Azure AD here, we are creating an app to model what we just looked through in all the code. Great. So now we're up here and we have a bunch of things here like call the application ID, an object ID, a directory and a tenant ID. Cool, we'll get back to them, but just know that these, these are important. And now we'll go to authentication. And so here we are telling our application how we expect the clients, our Azure AD application, how we expect clients to be talking to it. In this case, it'll be single page application and then a redirect URI. So where, because like I said before, it's going to be opening up. Once we hit that M cell, it's going to open up a web page. It wants to now know where it should send information back to. So here it's going to be HTTP localhost 3007. Like that. And I believe that's all we have to enter for this one. So I'll just configure it. And that's all we have to do for this one. We could do more. Um, like make sure it sends back both access and identity tokens. I think we can get away with just setting it like this because I know we are getting close to time right now. So I'll just run through and make sure I hit everything. Hello world identity. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. So the next thing then is to go over here, my M cell config. I want to copy these things over. So my first one is client ID. That client ID comes from here. It's the application client ID. So essentially what this is doing, when I uh, call Azure Active Directory, I have to pretty much say, this is the application within it that I want to, that I want to talk to. The next one is using this. So let's actually highlight it. How about I can right click, copy link. And so this is saying the authority. And so the authority essentially is like essentially the web address of who's going to be doing the authentication. And it's going to be login.microsoft.online.com slash our tenant. So the overall, like if you had your, like my old company, Codemail Technologies, they would have a different tenant ID here. And then finally for the um, redirect URI, again, we're looking at localhost 3007. So it's just making sure we send information back to where we want it to go. Good. We should be ready to run everything. So let's give it a, let's give it a shot. No server.js. All right. Let's give it a shot over here. How about I do localhost 3007? All right. I'm already logged in. Great. Let's try it now. I think I already have one open and a private browser. I'm not signed in yet. Private browser, right? Sign in. And now, okay, so before I breezed over it too quickly, let's go back. I was signed in already. That's because MCell said, you know what? I'm going to go look for a, a token. I see that you've already signed in in this web browser to this tenant before. I'm going to grab it and use it, right? It's cool. It, it's that smart. It knows it for us. This browser, it doesn't have it yet. So I do have to sign in. Pops up this window. This window right here comes from login.microsoftiline.com. It's not from my app. It's coming from Active Directory. So I'm going to sign in. Hit next. And all of a sudden, this two factor auth comes up. So let me approve that. And it's totally passwordless now. We don't, I don't have to enter my password. I actually probably don't even know what it is because it's completely reliant on applications. Going through, I'll trust the certificate. And now it's asking for what permissions I want. So these essentially are the um, are the policies. What it, This is what it's going to want to do. I have the consent saying, yep, that's cool. I, I grant it. Those accept it. And here we go. So it says that it's, oh, I saw the confetti go up. 
perfect demo. All right, my name at Microsoft.com, and then it gives me all of this info as well. So you're saying, you know what, Matt? Why did it give you? Where's the? It's, it looks different here. Why? Why? Because I didn't hear. I didn't. There was no that consent wasn't granted here, and it didn't pop up. So, yeah, there we go. And um, cool. That's the first demo, right? So we're getting close on time. So I'm going to breeze right to the quick next demo. Let's see what else we had in the slides so I can talk. Oh, account types. So here we go real quickly. Single tenant apps like I kind of talked about before where we're just like picking the Microsoft account. Great for line of business. Just you and everybody who works in your business can log in. Nobody else, right? So this one, just anybody that had a Microsoft at Microsoft.com could log into that. Nobody else could. Multi-tenant though, more can log in, right? So now we're giving, you know, like trusted business partners can now log in. They are much harder though to design for and get right. Because now you have to design all your authorization policies and such. They're super easy to set up over on the AD side, but now they're getting a little more difficult over on the on the code side to make things are, are all correct and everything like that. So we won't, that's really tough to get into. So obviously we can't get all the way into it now, but just know that it can be done, but it's, identity's tough. It's really tough. Um, applications and service principles. Okay. We looked at setting up an application in Azure AD, right? And so that models our application as a whole. However, you could set up a service principle for it as well. So a service principle is like a specific representation of your overall application in a specific tenant. Okay. And so, and tenant is like Microsoft.com or like CodeMillTechnologies.com. It's this is where things get weird when you have multiple tenants or multiple uh, tenant apps and you want to have one app running on Microsoft and one on a different one and how it's really hard to get things working correctly. So, yeah. So anyways, we looked at a cert, we looked at an application setting that up, getting that working in a single tenant. But when you want to have other people log in and you want to have that application running in multiple tenants, that's where service principles come in. And we didn't even get it touching in the managed identities, which I know that was a question that came up before too. Managed identities kind of come into play here as well, but yeah, um, the application is global. It's a representation of your app and a service principle is the actual, um, the implementation of it. All right. So yes. All right. Um, there we go. Let's just go right into the next in the next demo. Then I'm going to create a new one and then close that so I have it at the ready. And then the next demo has to deal with account types. Essentially setting this up for we, we looked at the single tenant already. That's what we already did. But let's do it with instead of um with node, let's do it with .NET and see how much, quite honestly, we had a lot of code here that we were writing. With .NET, a lot of that's taken care of for us. So I'm just gonna open up a brand new VS Code window here, and then I am going to go to my back out one level, and I'm gonna make here EX2. All right. All righty. So what we're going to do here then is I'm going to just new up the code and then we'll go over to the web browser and do that. So as Cam was showing you, we can set up a lot of the authentication already within uh, .NET. And so to do that, I'm just going to do a .NET new MVC application. Like so, and I'm going to specify the auth to it. So I'm going to say auth single org. 
and then let it do its thing. All right, so let's open it up in code now. Projects, let's learn. We'll make this super big. And so what we get here is it is already set scaffolded out for me to start entering like my Azure AD um, stuff for me. Yeah, let's download everything right away. And so what it has, like I have a login partial view for me. And so it's like using Azure identity or it's using the identity um, stuff. And if I look over here, I'm using Microsoft.identity.web and Microsoft.identity.web.ui. So everything is included for me. So it kind of gives me this nice shortcut where I can start going right away and using, um, be up and running very quickly. So let's get up and let's get running very quickly with it. So let me uh, rearrange my screen real quick and then We will uh, just all right. So what I'm going to do then is create. So we have this app already up and running, this Let's Learn Friday, and it's great. It's what I exactly I want to want. It's it's the authentication, single tenant, and everything. So the first thing that I'm gonna want to do is go into app settings and make sure I get everything right. So I have to update the tenant ID, which is right down here. Like so, get the client ID out of it, which is right there. Like that. And the next is getting the actual domain name out of it. And so the domain names is going to be like this, like contoso.onmicrosoft.com. You, you, you know it when you set it up. So once you set up, when you go through and you eventually create your account, Azure account, you know, whenever that is, you're going to know what your domain name is. I can guess what the Microsoft, what they did that. It's going to be microsoft.onmicrosoft.com. Cool. All right, so I have the the basics, the, the metadata, if you will, all set up. So next thing I need to do within this is make sure on my authentication section is that I have a new platform that I'm going to authenticate with, which this is not a single page application. It's just a regular application, web app. And so I want to enter my uh, redirect URL. And so right here where do we have them it's going to be well i'm make it run on 3007 again but it's going to be right if you can see it sign in dash oidc or it's also right here too sign in dash open id connect like i was mentioning before so let's https local host colon 3007 slash like so. So this is my redirect URL when I say, hey, I want to log in. It's going to call this out for me. And then I can have a logout redirect URL as well. So I can log out of the application. And that's going to be 3007 slash like Pretty sure it's going to be sign out dash OIDC. Better check to make sure. Sign in, sign out dash OIDC. And I also want to make sure I get my ID tokens because it's a little bit different flow um, that I'm using here. And I'm just going to make sure that we do local host. 2007, just so we have everything covered. Great. Save it. 
All right, so all I did here is I added a new type of configuration to use. So we had single page before, now I added a new one. Same application, same overall application within Azure Active Directory, but it now I tweaked it a little bit more. All right, so I'll save this. And I think I can go ahead and then change the properties, make sure we run on 3007. And then I'll just launch it up. All righty, here we go. All right, again, it knows who I was am because I was logged in. MCL took care of all that good stuff for me. Let's uh, try it brand new. I didn't restart my browser, so I'll just sign out. I want to sign out here. All right, so what's cool is it's taking care of all that for me. It's It knows I'm signed out. It did all that for me. I didn't have to worry about it. MCL did all that. I'll sign in again. Who am I? It already remembered that I had been signed in with this account. I don't want to forget it, but I could if I wanted to. This is not coming for me. This is coming from Azure AD. Approve 97. Sure, I'll stay signed in. And here I am again. And so now if I go back over to here, it'll give me some uh, information, copy it, that I can put into the uh, the home view, into the index. I'll just save that. And then changes get reflected automatically. And I can see various claims. And as Cam was saying before, this is who I claim to be. I claim to be Matt Soka with my email on it as well. Cool. Um, so yeah, so what we could do then is uh, create a, if I would try logging in and let's do it. I know we're running over time. We probably got cut off on one, but we'll keep on going because I'm having fun right now. Let's see, I want to sign out of here. Hang on a moment. Come on. All right, so I'll sign in, but I'll use another account. And we'll say it's a personal account. So it'll say 70. I'll approve that one. And I'll say, whoops, we're having trouble sending you in because I didn't set the app up to allow it within Azure Active Directory. Cool, right? I think it's cool. We could, though, we could go through here. And when we set up a brand new one, had we wanted to, we could just go through new. And then where's my app right here, new registrations. And then if I would hit this, the second one down, I then could have signed in with my other account. Great. And so that was what the uh, third exercise was gonna be all about, going about setting up a new one that way. And actually, there, isn't, there would be no changes at all within our code. It all just work. So it's all done and maintained up here in AD. So yeah, that's it. We did it. Like 40 minutes jam-packed of information. That but, was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> that was really jam-packed. But oh my gosh, that was super informative. Oh my, I learned so much just now. Um, we did run a little bit over, so I want to be quick with a few questions. We are capturing it all in the recording. Uh, on YouTube and our docs pages, so uh, it will be available. Um, but uh, in the interest of time, let's jump right into those questions. Um, I'll bring Cam back onto the stream uh, just as an additional expert, if Cam's cool with that. All right, great. So there we are. And all righty. So I know there was a lot of talk about um, AD, BTC, B2B, stuff like that. So I just want a couple, couple quick questions on that. 
Um, so does Azure B2C use JSON web token behind the scenes? Yeah. Yep. Oh, great. So <laughs> yeah, you, you always get a, a JWT back from it. Um, and that's when you, when you saw like all those claims and everything that was like, the, that was a JWT being pulled apart and displayed nicely. So when you get the JWP back, you can actually use something called JWT.ms, a website which does the pulling apart of everything and shows shows you things nicely. Oh. So. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, so you can Azure, use Azure for that. Um, so there were several questions around um, W. Oh, so sorry, JWT, um, like identity versus JWT uh, using web APIs. Um, yeah, which one would be better and when? Uh, we also have another question around that. Um, is that good enough to have like uh, the API controller create the JWT? So is there any sort of clarity you can give around that? And also what, uh, for those of us who don't know, what does JWT stand for? <laughs> um, Kim, what does it stand for? Is it JavaScript? Web Java, Java web token. Java web token. Or Java, 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 JavaScript web token, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's Looks like JSON. Um, Cameron, do you know that last one, like the X509 certs? And so, so this gets into that whole area that is definitely one of the questions that comes up the most that I never have a good answer for, to, to be quite honest. And, and that that is the the whole scenario with spas and web APIs, and and what do we do there? Um, that and unfortunately, I'm I'm a little out of my depth on that. Um, so I, I don't, I don't want to go, go, you know, just pulling answers out of the air and, and mislead people. Fair. I'm sure we all appreciate that. <laughs> all right. So we'll have to look into that a little bit more. Um, a couple other questions that we have, um, is, uh, so Matt, you just finished up showing that. So how is that different from identity server four? Um, I'm going to defer on this question or demur because I can't speak to identity server four. Um, so I, I can just a little bit. Um, identity server um, in in the whole flow of things, identity server is a secure token service that you can implement on your own, or I think they also offer a, like a cloud uh, implementation of it. I could be wrong on that. Don't hold me to that. Um, that that fits in the same spot as Azure AD or B2C, basically Microsoft Identity Platform, right? So it fits in that same spot as a third party um, authentication service that you can use. And it used to be that in the ASP.NET Core uh, web API templates, um, if you wanted authentication, and you click the little authentication box, you got an implementation of Identity Server right next to the web API. And um, JSON web token. Say I was I was wrong. I okay. Um, uh, anyway, um, so anyway, it used to be that, that identity server you would get an implementation of it sitting right next to the web API. Now identity server is still open source, but they've changed their licensing so that ab organizations above a certain level need to actually pay for it now. So I'm honestly not really a hundred percent sure what that. Um, what that does to the to the web API template and like if you turn on authentication in web API now I haven't gone down that rabbit hole um, certainly there's there's a lot of rabbit holes in auth and and that's just one that I that I, I admit that I get a lot of questions about it but it's not one that I've dived down a lot okay well we appreciate your your knowledge and expertise on the subject regardless um, okay, so I'll just ask uh, one more for each of you, um, Cam. So uh, earlier you had mentioned uh, creating roles and users. Uh, do you ever rebuild and or port the old UI system for those users and roles you created? Um, you know, I I don't know. It might be out there somewhere. I haven't seen it. I haven't had reason to to dig into it. Um, I know who to ask. Um, but unfortunately I, I don't have the, you know, the ability to, to, to pull them up like right this second. Um, but I would, so take a look at, I could, I will ask, um, the security expert for ASP.NET core who, who kind of owns that whole identity system, um, is a, is a gentleman named Barry, uh, Barry Dorans. I will actually hit him up 
And um, if 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 there's anything to share there, I will post it on my Twitter. Oh, well, there there we go. John Galloway answered for us. Thank you, John. Our our man behind the curtain running production here for our event today. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, and and uh, last question in the interest of time. Um, I believe it was this one that I wanted to show. And this one's for Matt. Uh, Matt, can we implement identity uh, with a custom login page? I think you touched yes. on that. Yep, you can change um, on, yes. Quick answer is yes. And there are a whole bunch of, uh, we, we didn't get into where you can customize the entire flow or the journey, as I think they're being called now with the new identity platform of way folks run through the login. The journey. Yeah, and they can change the way everything looks and feels as, as they run through it too, including as where Cam was getting into what information you collect as people sign up, like if you're doing a B2C application. So yes, you can uh, customize it to exactly what your company's branding and wants. That's, that's also true. That's true of Microsoft Identity Platform, but it's also true of the ASP.NET Core Identity Framework. Right, because you you so um, that's that second big set exercise in that uh, learn module that covered identity framework, where we add the first name and last name. We we show you how to customize the registration form to add first name and last name, but you can replace that registration form with whatever you want, as long as it still does the same stuff behind the scenes. All right. Uh, well, thank you so much, both of you. That was absolutely amazing. We really appreciate your time here spent dedicated to helping us all learn so much about auth and identity. Thank you uh, for those following along. These are where you can find all of the resources for this event and more. Um, thank you all for those who joined us live. We really appreciate you spending two hours with us plus to learn all about this. Uh, thank you so much. We can't not wait to see you for our next event in July on Blazor Hybrid Maui. So looking forward to that. And thank you again. Take care, everyone.